Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, we're very excited to have you with us today for this session on breast cancer screening. We can do better. Um, being um, presented by Dr. Dr. Paula Gordon. Um, Paula uh, put up a picture of herself because we had a little bit of a technical difficulty in that we couldn't actually get her live picture to show. Um, so uh, at this point that uh, you'll see her on this slide and then um, you'll uh, hear her presentation. Uh, what we'd like to do today is um, to go through about 45 minutes of her presentation and then have some opportunity for questions or comments and that at the end of the presentation. Um, the presentation is going to be in English, but um, discussion in the Q&A uh, will be in both French and English, whichever um, you prefer uh, to um, ask your question in. Um, that should be it as far as housekeeping. Um, if for some reason we run out of time today and you still had more questions and comments, uh, we will be monitoring the chat and so we will get response back to people um, at a later point. And on that note then, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Claire LeBlanc, who is going to introduce our speaker for us. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, bonjour à tous. I'm Claire LeBlanc, President of the New Brunswick Breast and Women's Cancer Partnership. Je suis Claire Leblanc, uh, présidente uh, du partenariat du cancer du sein et des cancers féminins du Nouveau-Brunswick. Nous organisons le, le webinar d'aujourd'hui uh, en collaboration avec les réseaux de santé uh, Horizon et Vitalité, ainsi que Dense Breast Canada. Hi Jenny, un gros merci. Uh, we are hosting today's webinar in collaboration with both the Horizon and Vitalité Health Networks, as well as Dense Breast Canada. Again, many thanks to these collaborators. Today's amazing uh, speaker, Dr. Paula Gordon, is a clinical professor in the Department of Radiology of uh, UBC. In recognition of her contributions, or many contributions, I should say, uh, to the field of breast imaging, she was made a fellow of the Society of Breast Imaging. She is one of Canada's leading experts in breast cancer detection and diagnosis. Her advocacy for breast cancer screening and early detection has led to a marked decline in breast cancer deaths. We are so fortunate to be learning uh, uh, from her today. La conférencière d'aujourd'hui, la Dr. Paula Gordon, est professeure clinicienne au département de radiologie de UBC. Elle a reçu plusieurs reconnaissances pour ses contributions au domaine de l'imagerie mammaire. Elle est l'une des plus grandes expertes canadiennes en matière de détection et du diagnostic du cancer du sein. Son plaidoyer pour le dépistage et la détection précoce du cancer du sein a entraîné une baisse marquée, mais c'est pas pu dire, hein, des décès par cancer du sein. Donc, aujourd'hui, nous avons la chance d'apprendre d'elle et c'est très apprécié. The, so, uh, but, well, I guess um, uh, Kim did mention about the uh, making your concerns, your comments uh, known on the chat box and they will definitely be uh, responded to either this afternoon if time allows and then and then at a later date. Uh, soon. Donc, sans plus tarder, uh, nous laissons uh, la parole uh, au Dr. Paula Gordon, and without further delay and ado, we will leave uh, the, the speaker corner to uh, Dr. Paula Gordon. 
Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gordon, for accepting to do that and to be with us this afternoon to share this knowledge. My, abs my absolute pleasure. Thank you so much, Claire and Kim, and uh, for arranging uh, this opportunity to speak. So you've seen my topic is breast cancer screening and surveillance. We can do better. And uh, just to get the term straight away, when I use the term screening, I'm referring to looking for cancers in women with no symptoms who have not had cancer. But I'll also discuss the follow up of women who've had breast cancer. And for that, I'll use the term surveillance. Here are my disclosures. I'm here on a volunteer basis and I have no relevant financial conflicts. Today, I'm going to describe the importance of early detection for breast cancer and the optimal strategy for achieving that in as many women as possible. I'll describe the flawed process used in making guidelines that affect millions of Canadian women. I'll discuss the evidence for screening mammography starting at age 40. We know that mammography saves lives, but it is not a perfect test. I'll continue with the evidence for supplemental screening for women with dense breasts and the various tests that can be used and the recommended surveillance for women with breast cancer. Now, most women are aware that the risk of breast cancer is higher in those who have a family history, like a mother or sister with breast cancer. But women and even sometimes physicians are surprised when they learn that 85% of breast cancers occur in women with no family history. And that's why all women need to be screened, not just those at increased risk. Many of the goals of screening apply also to surveillance. We want to find cancers early to do two things, to save lives, but also to allow successful treatment with less aggressive therapy. The Canadian Cancer Society stats are that overall, 88% of women are alive five years after they're diagnosed with breast cancer, but it very much depends on what stage their cancer is. When we find cancer when it's small and before it has spread to the lymph nodes, 100% of women are alive at five years. And the good news is that about 65% of women are diagnosed at stage one. But five-year survival drops when the stage of diagnosis is more advanced. It's only 22% alive at five years when cancer is diagnosed at stage four. And this shows the importance of early detection. Now, there are different ways to look for cancer. Breast self-exams are currently discouraged, and I'll explain later why that's wrong. Mammography is the mainstay, and I'll describe some of the other tests that can be used in special circumstances and some newer ones that are emerging. But please know that thermography has been thoroughly discredited. It can find big cancers close to the skin, but those aren't the ones that are a problem for us. It misses smaller cancers and the ones deeper in the breast, and it has loads of false alarms. Now, we know that annual mammograms starting at age 40 save the most lives. But there's a panel in Canada called the Canadian Task Force on Preventive Health Care that says that women in their 40s shouldn't be screened. And that panel influences screening policy across Canada. Here's the proof that screening mammograms save lives starting at 40. This is a list of the randomized trials done worldwide. We have been studying mammograms since 1963, but even the most recent of these randomized trials is 35 years old. Now, all of these studies were done when we used X-ray film mammograms. And of course, there have been major advances in mammography technology since then, but that Canadian task force decided to limit themselves to only these studies to make their guidelines. Now, that's crazy. That's like making communication guidelines based on rotary phone technology. And not only are these studies old, we now have proof that the two done in Canada were significantly flawed and they should not be used to make screening policy. The old trials are still important though because they proved that screening mammography saves lives in women aged 40 to 40, sorry, 40 to 74. Now here are the results of all the trials. Don't try to read the whole slide. Focus on the column on the right. It tells us whether the risk of dying from breast cancer was reduced by an invitation to have a screening mammogram. And if that number is less than one, then women who were invited to have a mammogram were less likely to die. And that was true for most of the studies. But look at the two from Canada, outlined in red. They were outliers. They were the only ones where women were more likely to die of breast cancer if they were invited to have a mammogram. And now we know why. That's an hour lecture in itself. 
but when the flawed Canadian studies are averaged together with the better studies, the result was that there was a 15 to 20% reduction in breast cancer deaths in women invited to have a mammogram. And even though these trials were performed decades ago, as I said, they proved that screening mammography saves lives beginning at age 40. Now the pink graph on the left is the mortality rates for cancer in women in Canada from 1969 to 1996. And the flat line at the top you can see here is, uh, shows you that breast cancer death rate was relatively stable during those years. The green graph on the right is the same information, but it starts at 1989, which is after when screening mammography started in Canada, and it's projected to 2020. And you can see this green line that's plummeting shows the breast cancer death rate since we started screening in Canada. And this is compelling evidence that screening works. Now in the prior slides, you heard me say the expression women invited to have mammograms. And that's because in a study and even in real life, not all women invited to have mammograms do. But in a study, if women invited to mam have mammograms don't, and if they get breast cancer and die of it, their death is still included in the mammogram group, even though the women didn't have a mammogram. So those studies and these graphs actually underestimate the benefits of mammograms, meaning the benefits are even greater than you can see in that plummeting line. This is a graph of the number of breast cancer deaths avoided. The orange line goes up on the top here, is the number of deaths that would have occurred if the death rate was the same as in 1986. And the blue line is the actual number of deaths. So there have been 32,000 fewer breast cancer deaths since 1986, which is a huge indication of the success of screening and improved treatment. Now, this is an observational study from Canada. It's the largest published study of modern mammography in the whole medical literature. They obtained data on almost 3 million women attending screening programs in Canada, and they compared them to the women who didn't have mammograms. They showed that overall, women who attended screening are 40% less likely to die of breast cancer than those who don't. And women in their 40s are 44% less likely to die. Now note the huge difference between this study of modern mammograms in women actually having them than the 15% mortality in the old randomized trials. So if you want to reduce your chances of dying of breast cancer, it makes sense to start having mammograms at age 40. Now, unfortunately, only four provinces in Canada allow women to start self-referring at age 40. The rest, including New Brunswick, don't start until age 50. Here are the recommendations of that task force panel for average risk women. They recommend against routine screening for women 40 to 49, and that's dangerous because although breast cancer is less common in younger women, it grows faster. That's because before menopause, the ovaries are still making estrogen. The next point, the task force recommends screening women aged 50 to 74 only every two to three years. And that's what your program in New Brunswick currently recommends. Well, waiting two years instead of one gives cancers more time to grow before we find them. And every three years is worse. The next point, the task force re recommend against women doing breast self-examination and against healthcare providers performing breast, per, uh, providing uh, breast exams. And they recommend against supplemental screening for women with dense breasts. Now, how could that task force arrive at these recommendations knowing the data I've just shown you? Well, first of all, the task force still uses only those flawed Canadian trials and other randomized trials, now, even though the Canadian trials have been discredited. Second, I want you to know who's on the Canadian task force. They're a panel of volunteers, but there are no experts in breast cancer. The head of the panel that made these guidelines is a kidney specialist, a nephrologist, and there were nurses and family doctors, but also an occupational therapist and even a chiropractor. But there was no oncologist, no breast surgeon, no radiologist. They deliberately excluded any experts from participating. The task force used that 15% mortality reduction that I showed you in the old trials to determine the benefits of screening and they ignored the 40 plus percent mortality reduction in the observational studies. They also ignored other important benefits of early detection. The task force did not consider the option for lumpectomy rather than mastectomy when cancers are found early. You probably recognize that this is lymphedema. 
It's a common side effect of the surgery to sample lymph nodes in the armpit as part of breast cancer lymph node staging. Compression sleeves can be used and microsurgery is being studied to try to treat it. But for most women, it's permanent and it's life changing. It's the most frequent complication that influences breast cancer patients quality of life. It would be best if we could prevent lymphedema and the risk of lymphedema after the armpit node uh, staging is up to 33%. Now, when cancer is detected early, women can have a less invasive sentinel node biopsy instead, where the risk of lymphedema is as low as 2%. Women deserve the opportunity to avoid this complication, but the task force completely ignored this benefit of early detection. Nowadays, many women can avoid chemotherapy if their cancer is small and if there are no positive nodes. The panel did not consider this benefit either. So we should start screening all average women annually starting at 40. And starting at 40 is especially important for Black, Asian, and Hispanic women. They have earlier onset and a peak incidence of breast cancer in the mid 40s. Compared that to the peak in Caucasian women, which is in the late 50s. Now, as I explained, breast cancer is less common in younger women, but it's more aggressive because of the presence of ovarian hormones. So it's not trivial. This is a Canadian Cancer Society graph from 2016, where there were 3,300 women in Canada aged 40 to 49 with breast cancer. But we know that breast cancer is increasing in younger women. And in 2022, it's projected that there will be almost 4,500 cases in women in Canada aged 40 to 49. A statistic not considered by the task force is the, the years of life lost to breast cancer. And this diagram shows it in five-year increments. Now, younger women have more potential years of life to lose. So for example, if we find an early cancer in a 70-year-old woman, and we save her life, she may gain 20 years of life. But if we save the life of a 40 year old woman, we potentially add 50 years to her life. And this diagram, the women 40 to 49 and 50 to 59 are shown in uh, 10 year increments rather than five. And you can see that the years of life lost to breast cancer are higher in women in the 40s than in the 50s, or in fact, in any other decade. Research done in Canada shows that annual screening from 40 to 74 prevents the most deaths and results in the most life years saved. Screening every two to three years from 50 to 74, as currently recommended in New Brunswick, will lead to later detection and more deaths. So I hope you agree with me, it makes sense to screen women in their 40s. They are often caring for young children and aging parents. They're working and contributing to the economy. They are not expendable. Women aged 40 to 49 may self-refer for mammograms starting at 40 in four provinces, but not New Brunswick. Each province and territory decides what to offer, so a woman's access to early detection depends where she lives. The left column shows the four jurisdictions where women can self-refer at age 40. In New Brunswick, a woman can have a mammogram in her 40s if she gets a requisition from her doctor but some women tell us that when they ask for a requisition, they're denied by their doctors because the doctors follow the task force guidelines. And what about women who don't have a family doctor? Well, they're really out of luck. According to figures provided by Horizon, only 7% of women in New Brunswick, aged 40 to 49, had a mammogram in 2019. And I'll come back to this chart later. The task force says the potential harms of screening outweigh the benefits. Well, if the benefits are saving more lives and the ability to have less aggressive therapy, what do they mean by harms? Well, the one they're most concerned about is the anxiety women experience if they're recalled for screening for more tests. They even make it sound worse than it is by referring to these as false positives. Now, in most contexts, false positive would mean that we told you you had cancer when you didn't. And that's not it. They're referring to when a woman is recalled for additional tests. I think they should call them false alarms or recalls. And false alarms happen with all screening tests. We're, we know that it happens for, with pap smears. So in, in Canada, typically, for every thousand women who have a screening mammogram, about 7% or 70 are recalled for additional tests. And those recalls certainly cause anxiety, but it's transient. The vast majority of women will just need 
uh, an extra mammographic picture, some will need an ultrasound. And at the end of the day, most of these women will be told everything's fine, go back to regular screening. So their anxiety is short lived. But of the 70 who are recalled, 16% of them, 11 will need a needle biopsy. Now, needle biopsy sounds scary, but actually it's done with local freezing and it shouldn't be significantly more painful than a blood test. And of those 11 women, four will be diagnosed with breast cancer and usually early breast cancer. This chart is from the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer and it shows the false alarm rates in the different decades. And here's at the patient's first screen and subsequent screens. And you can see that for every decade of life, the likelihood of recall is higher, highest on the first screen. It's almost identical among the decades. So there's no reason to make women wait until age 50 to start having regular mammograms if, if what you're really concerned about is the false alarms. In fact, the cutoff age of age 50 has no scientific basis as a threshold for screening. False alarms cause anxiety, of course, even though only, as you just saw, about five or six percent of the women who are called back are ultimately diagnosed with breast cancer. The task force thinks that we should spare women the anxiety of false alarms, and that's why they recommend starting screening later and screening less often, even though they know more women will die. Now, women disagree. That's patronizing. It's condescending. Research in pit, researchers in Pittsburgh surveyed women attending for routine screening and they found that 97% believed that having a false alarm would not deter them from having regular screening going forward. And 82% said they'd be willing to have a needle biopsy if it might increase the chance of detecting cancer earlier if they had cancer. Now in this comic, the task force member is saying, yes, regular mammograms and early detection would have saved your life, but aren't you glad we spared you all that anxiety? The task force thinks it's more important to save women some transient anxiety from being recalled for extra tests, even though more young women will die. Now, in my day to day practice, the women who are the most stressed are those who find out that their cancer is big and it may have spread to the lymph nodes and that perhaps it could have been found earlier. They are justifiably anxious and angry. The, uh, another concern of the task force is something called overdiagnosis, and this is a bit difficult to explain because it's theoretical. It's, it's the theoretical possibility that a woman will uh, be diagnosed with cancer and be treated, but then she's going to die of something else before her cancer would have killed her. So as an example, let's say we find a cancer, the woman gets treated for it, and then six months later, she dies in a car accident or has a heart attack or gets a more aggressive other cancer let's well, pancreatic cancer, for example, the likelihood of overdiagnosis in younger women is almost zero because they're less likely to have other diseases. The task force thinks that around half of cancers are overdiagnosed, but that's because they used, they, they used those flawed Canadian trial, uh, trials to come up with their estimate. Most experts agree that overdiagnosis occurs in about one to 10% and probably in the lower end of that range. Here's a study where they surveyed almost 3,000 women about overdiagnosis and 95% said they still wanted to be screened. And many women are willing to accept the risks of screening in order to reduce the likelihood of a breast cancer death. But women should be informed about false alarms and overdiagnosis. And when you do the math, mammograms reduce deaths by at least 40% and the risk of overdiagnosis is one to 10%. So if you don't have a crystal ball, and if you don't know that you're gonna be killed in a car accident or have a fatal heart attack in the next couple of years, mammography is definitely the way to go. So when our provincial screening programs don't offer ideal screening, it's not just because they don't want to pay for it, it's because they accept guidelines from a task force panel who think that women, women should, shouldn't have to suffer some anxiety from a screening call, even if it increases their risk of dying of breast cancer. Perhaps those in the position to make decisions don't realize that those recommendations are not coming from experts. So the evidence supports starting screening at 40 and ideally annually, but when should screening stop? Well, the task force says 74 because that's the old randomized trials only included women up to age 74 and some provinces and territories have defaulted to that. But we know that breast cancer risk increases with age and if a woman doesn't die of something else, her risk of breast cancer keeps climbing. If a woman is in good health, 
with a life expectancy of seven to 10 years and is well enough to have treatment if cancer is found, then it's worth continuing screening to find those cancers when they're small and more easily treated. This life expectancy chart is from Statistics Canada. The average life expectancy for a 75 year old woman is 13 years. At age 80, it's 10 years. So stopping at age 80 would be reasonable, but it depends on a woman's general health and her personal values. In the absence of other illness, screening benefits significantly outweigh the risk of overdiagnosis until age 90. So these women should be offered screening, and that includes women who've had breast cancer. I like to tell the story of a personal friend of mine who's 84, and she bought a bike last year, and she, reads 10, she rides 10K three times a week. So it depends on a woman's level of health and her personal preferences. Back to this chart. The column on the right shows seven jurisdictions that allow women to self-refer after 75. New Brunswick is not one of them. In New Brunswick, a woman over age 74 must ask their doctor for a requisition, and then she's in the same boat as a woman under 50 if her doctor uh, has drunk the Kool-Aid from the task force. Now, mammograms aren't perfect. Now, one way they're not perfect, as I've told you, is the false alarms, finding things that turn out not to be cancer, like cysts, for example. Another way they aren't perfect is that mammograms don't find all cancers. Women with dense breasts and women at higher than average risk need other screening in addition to mammograms, not instead of, but in addition to mammograms. And that includes women who've had breast cancer. Survivors have a four times higher risk of interval breast cancers compared to individuals without a personal history of breast cancer. The best way to explain breast density is with pictures. Dense tissue is the main reason that cancers can be missed on a mammogram. Here's an, sorry, I've skipped a slide, here we go. Here's an obvious cancer on a mammogram. And the reason I'm 100% sure that it's cancer, here's the magnification view. You can see the jaggedy edges around and these little white dots lined up here. Those are malignant calcifications. It's not uh, always easy to see cancers on a mammogram though. And the reason we can see this one is because the cancer's white and the rest of her breast is dark gray. Now, I just want you to remember what this cancer looks like for the next few slides. So radiologists divide breast density into four density categories, A to D, and look how different these breasts look, and they're all normal. Category C and D with more white stuff are regarded as dense, and A and B are regarded as non-dense. The denser the breast, the more likely that a cancer will be overlooked. This woman's breasts are category A, almost entirely fat, and fat is dark gray on a mammogram. Now, remember that cancer I showed you? If she had that cancer from a few slides ago, we'd have no trouble seeing it in her breasts. These breasts are also normal, but they're not dark gray. There's a little more white stuff in their category B. We'd have probably have a good chance of seeing that cancer in these breasts. Now, these breasts are normal too, but these are category C, and they have even more normal dense tissue, and it becomes harder to see cancers, which are white, in a background of white. We might see that cancer if it developed up here in her breast, but it might be masked in her normal dense tissue if it developed uh, where the yellow arrows are pointing. Now, some women are category D with no fat and even a large cancer could be missed in this woman. Mammograms miss up to 50% of cancers in women with category D densest breasts. Now, look at the picture on the far left and you see that white little cancer moving from breast to breast you can see that it's easier to see if it overlies the fat and the denser the breast, the less likely we're gonna be able to see it. And when cancer is missed on a mammogram and it isn't discovered and treated, it continues to grow and potentially spread until it's big enough to feel. Now, when a cancer is found, usually as a lump, and the woman's last screening mammogram was negative, it's called an interval cancer because it developed in the interval between planned screening. Interval cancers are larger at diagnosis and more often node positive than screen detected cancers. They tend to be more aggressive, higher nuclear grade, and they have a poorer prognosis compared to screen detected cancers. So an important goal of screening is to reduce the number of interval cancers. Now, how do you know if you've got dense breasts? Only by having a mammogram. You cannot tell by what your breast feels like. If it, if it feels lumpy, it doesn't mean it's dense. Lumpy breasts can be dense or fatty. Soft breasts might be dense. Both fatty and dense breasts can feel soft, firm, or lumpy. And your doctor can't tell by doing a breast exam either. 
So the biggest risk of dense breasts is the masking of cancers, but here's the double whammy. We have known since the 1970s that breast density itself is a risk factor for developing cancer. Women with the densest breasts, category D, are four to six times more likely to develop breast cancer than women with fatty breasts, category A. Having dense breasts is the most prevalent risk factor, more so even than having a family history. The denser the breast, the higher the risk. Dense tissue also increases the risk of an interval cancer, one that is detected as a lump between mammograms. And as I mentioned before, they have a poor prognosis compared to screen detected cancers. We've known since the 1990s that women with the dense, densest breasts are 13 to 18 times more likely to have an interval cancer than women with fatty breasts, and they have worse outcomes. We can find many of those cancers when they're small by doing supplemental screening, and we can prevent them from becoming interval cancers. This study from the Netherlands confirmed that women with dense tissue don't benefit from having mammograms to the same extent as women with fatty breasts. Women with dense Excuse breasts. Me. Yes. We no longer I, see your. We no longer see your slides. Ooh, interesting. Okay, Maybe. let me let me just play with this for a second. Thank you. So, thanks for letting me know. Um, can can you see anything? Just the participants. Okay, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to go. So okay, it stopped slide sharing. So I'm going to open slide share screen sharing rather. Aren't we? Aren't you glad we did this dry run yesterday? And now I'm going to do slideshow. Uh, play from current slide. Can you see now? Perfect. Thank you. Woo! Thank you. <laughs> this study from the Netherlands. I'll just go back to the beginning of this slide. Confirmed that women with dense tissue don't benefit as much from uh, mammograms. Women with dense breasts who have mammograms reduce their risk of dying by only 13%, whereas women with non-dense breasts reduce their risk of dying by 41%. And I'll put that a different way. Women with dense breasts are discriminated against if they have access only to mammograms for breast cancer screening. The percentages vary, but in this study, mammograms were as high as 93% sensitive in fatty breasts and as low as 57% sensitive in extremely dense breasts. But you already heard me say it can be as high as 50% of cancers being missed in the densest breasts. So dense breasts are normal and they're common. And the prevalence of dense tissue is similar in the US and Canada. About 43% of women over the age of 40 have dense breasts. Now, in this study, 36% were category C. Here we go 36% were category C, and 7% were category D. Some women's breasts may become less dense and more fatty with age, generally around menopause, but not all. And while it's normal to have dense breasts, women need to know if they have dense breasts so they can understand the implications. So breast density is an important piece of health information, like knowing your blood pressure, but women were not being told. When Dense Breast Canada began, began advocating in 2017, no jurisdiction was directly informing women of their breast density in their results letter after a screening mammogram. Now six Canadian jurisdictions inform women of their breast density, including New Brunswick. This fall, Yukon will start and Saskatchewan will start next year. This is only because of the work of patient advocates, not doctors, not science, but because women got out of their chairs and worked to get the governments to change uh, the standards. So back to this chart, the third column from the left shows that only six jurisdictions are directly informing all women of their breast density. In five jurisdictions, women in category D are told, and that's problematic because women in category C who are also dense are misled into thinking that they don't have dense breasts. There we go, category D. So here are the six jurisdictions that, uh, it, that tell women in category D and let them have annual mammograms. Now, as I've said, ideally all women should, but a recent Canadian study showed that provinces that screen category D women annually have fewer interval cancers. And remember, that's important. We want to reduce interval cancers. Breast cancer survivors have a seven times higher risk of a second cancer in the same or the opposite breast than women who haven't had cancer. 
The risk of recurrence is highest in the first five years after treatment. I don't know why my slides are advancing by themselves, sorry. Um, where was I? And because mammograms are less sensitive in survivors compared to the overall screening population, they also have four times higher interval cancers. All international guidelines recommend annual mammograms for survivors. Now, other than mammograms, there are variability in the guidelines. The most recommended supplemental screening surveillance tests are breast MRI and whole breast ultrasound, with MRI being preferred. MRI is recommended for survivors who are less than age 50 at the time of diagnosis and those who've had breast cancer who have dense breasts or women who are otherwise at increased risk for a second breast cancer. Ultrasound is recommended as an alternative in patients who can't have MRI. And I'm gonna talk about these in some other emerging tests later. If we're going to do supplemental test to find cancers missed on mammograms, there are two criteria that they should satisfy. One, they should find cancers that are small, invasive, and node negative, and they should lead to fewer interval cancers. So I'm going to briefly discuss some other tests proposed for supplemental screening. Tomosynthesis, sometimes called 3D mammography, or digital breast tomosynthesis is one of those. It's not really a separate test. It's just a better mammogram. <coughs> Before it was released onto the market in 2012, testing showed that, more, that it found more cancers than regular 2D mammograms, and it reduced recalls. It is widely used in the US already, but it's not used in the New Brunswick screening program or any other mammography screening program in Canada. When it was introduced, we hoped that it would find all those cancers we were missing on mammograms and that we wouldn't need to do supplemental screening, but it doesn't. Researchers in Italy compared how many additional cancers were found using 3D compared with ultrasound. Ultrasound detected nearly twice as many additional cancers as 3D, and other research showed that although it's most helpful in categories B and C densities, it doesn't actually find many additional cancers in BIRADS A or D. The reason is that we find most of the cancers in the uh, BIRADS A uh, fatty breasts, so TOMO doesn't find significantly more, and it's not helpful in category D for the same reason we don't see them on 2D. Those cancers are still masked when there's very little fat. So using 3D does not reduce the need for supplemental screening in women with dense tissue. Here's an example of cancer uh, hiding in a dense breast. This is actually an acquaintance of mine. She had a negative mammogram at age 50. But remember, negative in a woman with dense breast doesn't always mean no cancer. Eight months later, she came back after finding a lump in her left breast. The, arrow, the yellow arrow here is pointing to this triangular sticker that the technologist puts on the patient's skin right over the lump so we'll know where we should expect to see it on the mammogram. We repeated her mammogram, not only with 2D, but with 3D, and it was still completely negative, no lump visible. But when we did her ultrasound, we saw her 3.2 centimeter cancer, and it had already spread to the lymph nodes. So this is a typical interval cancer, and we see cases like this every single week. As I told you, interval cancers are 13 to 18 times more common in women with dense breasts. I told her that she was the poster child for breast density notification and supplemental screening. She had said that prior to me saying that, the only time she'd heard of dense breasts was one time when she had her mammogram and the technologist had said, wow, your breasts are really dense, but the technologist didn't explain what that meant. And this uh, a woman went on to help Dense Breast Canada advocate for breast density notification. Research from two separate hospitals in the Harvard system looked at the use of 3D for routine screening in cancer survivors, and they compared the data with the period of time before they got 3D. The false alarm rate was lower with 3D, which is a really good thing, but there was no significant difference in the cancer detection rate between 2D and 3D. In one of the reports, many of the interval cancers were still being diagnosed when the woman found her own lump. But some of the women were also having MRI, and the MRIs were finding cancers missed on 3D. Other research shows that 3D doesn't reduce interval cancer rates, but if 3D isn't a great supplemental screen in terms of finding cancers missed on mammograms or reducing interval cancers, it's still a good mammogram to do for screening instead of 2D because of the fewer false alarms. MRI has been used for women at very high risk since 2007. 
It binds cancers missed on mammograms and it has the highest cancer detection rate, 10 to 16 per thousand in the first round. It uses no ionizing radiation. It's been proven to reduce interval cancers and late stage disease. The downsides are that it requires intravenous uh, injection of contrast called gadolinium, which is known to accumulate in the brain and other organs. Although as of now, there are no long-term effects. For MRI, claustrophobia can be a big issue because a standard MRI requires 45 minutes in the magnet. So you, the lady lies on the table with her breasts hang, she's lying on her tummy with her breasts in these uh, spaces, and then she's put into that tunnel. And that can be really awful for women with claustrophobia. In general, also MRI can't be done in patients with pacemakers and other metallic implants. It's very expensive and access is inadequate in many areas. In this trial in the Netherlands, MRI is being offered to women with category D breasts after a negative 2D mammogram in a randomized trial. And in the first year, MRI found 16.5 cancers per thousand uh, after a negative mammogram. Now, most of those were invasive, the majority were node negative, and their false alarm rate was acceptable at 8%. Just for comparison, mammograms find about five cancers per thousand. So you take women with a negative mammogram, you find your five cancers, but then you find another 16.5 per thousand in the women if you do an MRI. Women in that trial who had MRI had six times fewer interval cancers than women who only had mammograms. And remember, minimizing interval cancers is one of the key goals of screening. But interestingly, only 41% of the women who were offered MRI, sorry, 41% declined it. Only 60% only of the women who were offered it accepted it. Now, there's a faster way of doing breast MRI called abbreviated MRI. And instead of the conventional scan, which takes about 45 minutes, this one is 10 minutes. And so it's faster to do, it's faster to read, and that will make it less expensive and it might make it more tolerable for women with claustrophobia. But it still requires that intravenous gadolinium, so it doesn't overcome that concern. There's an ongoing study comparing abbreviated MRI with tomosynthesis in screening women with dense breasts. And in the first year, they found an additional 10 cancers per thousand on MRI that were missed on 3D, most of which are invasive. And all the DCIS cases that they found were important. They were intermediate and high grade. There haven't been enough numbers of survivors included in studies of abbreviated MRI yet, but it's, we know it's better than mammography or ultrasound. And so far, the sensitivity of abbreviated MRI is pretty close to the full protocol MRI. So who should have screening MRI? Here we go. The list is likely to change with additional research, but as of now in the United States, the recommendations are for women with a calculated lifetime risk of over 20%. Now that includes women with genetic, genetic mutations like BRCA and other, some, some other more rare defects, women who've had chest radiation for Hodgkin's lymphoma, and women who've had a previous biopsy showing atypia or um, LCIS. In Europe, there are brand new recommendations that women with category D breast should have MRI every two to four years but they acknowledge that there aren't enough MRI machines to do that yet. So they say until there are, women who can't get an MRI and women who can't tolerate an MRI should have mammography and ultrasound. For breast cancer survivors, it's a bit more complex. Some breast cancer survivors are at greater than 20% lifetime risk, but not all. It depends on the age the cancer was diagnosed, whether it was hormone positive or negative, and how it was treated. This graph shows the risk profile of a woman diagnosed at age 45. If she has a lumpectomy, oops, if she has a lumpectomy, her risk stays above 20% till about age 66. But if she's had a mastectomy, her risk is less than 25, 20%. And this refers only to the risk of lowering her risk of dying, not to earlier detection of a potential cancer in the opposite breast. What about surveillance MRI for survivors? Although one large study showed no difference in sensitivity between MRI and mammography, other studies show much higher sensitivity, like the second bullet point here, where MRI detected an additional 18 cancers per thousand, and most of those cancers were in women under the age of 50. And since the studies are showing, showing few or no interval cancers within two years of a surveillance MRI, it's proposed that women could have their MRIs at two-year intervals rather than annually. 
In the USA, surveillance MRI is recommended for women with dense breasts who've had cancer and for women of all breast densities whose cancer was diagnosed before age 50. So why not do MRI for all women who've had cancer? Well, there's a chance we may eventually do so, but there are no randomized trials showing reduced mortality by doing MRI surveillance in survivors. So the current guidelines vary because of insufficient data showing benefit and concerns about cost and morbidity. The next test I'll talk about is ultrasound. Now we published this paper. Oh, interesting, there we go. We published this paper over 25 years ago and it was followed by work from multiple other institutions and then multi-center trials that showed that high resolution ultrasound can find cancers that are too small to feel and are missed on mammograms, largely because of dense breast tissue. This international multi-center multi trial found 5.3 cancers per thousand women screened in the first year and an average of 4.3 cancers per thousand women over three years. And those were cancers that were missed on their mammograms. Most of the cancers were small, invasive, and node negative, which is when we want to find cancers. Interestingly, the participants were all offered a free MRI at the end of the study, and it found an additional 14.7 per thousand cancers that were missed on the mammograms and ultrasound. But like the Dutch MRI study I showed you before, 42% of the women who were offered declined, even though it was free. Now, ultrasound can be done with a handheld probe or a large footprint probe uh, that scans about a third of the breast at one scan, and it's called automated breast ultrasound. I understand automated uh, is available at some clinics in Ontario and Alberta. Now, any ultrasound machine can do breast ultrasound, but not all clinics offer it. And because of the task force guidelines and some of the wording on provincial websites, some family doctors refuse to uh, refer their patients for screening ultrasound. In BC, we've been able to do supplemental ultrasound since January 9, 2019, covered by provincial health insurance for any woman in category C or D with a doctor's requisition. My colleagues published um, our in outcomes so far. We're finding seven cancers per thousand and the average patient age was 55 and they're all small and node negative. And remember, these are all cancers that were missed on their mammograms. Importantly, 40% were found in women with no family history and 60% were in women with category C density. Even this older study showed the value of adding ultrasound to mammograms for women with dense breasts. Now, as you now know, the interval cancer rate is much higher in women with dense breasts, but in this study, they did mammograms plus ultrasound in women with dense breasts, and they were able to lower the incidence of interval cancers to the same rate as women with fatty breasts just having mammograms. So they removed that inequity. The task force says that dense breasts don't need supplemental screening, and that's because they ignored all the studies I just showed you, insisting that they would only consider randomized trials. And until now, there had not been a randomized trial of screening ultrasound like we've had with screening mammograms. There is one now, and it's called the JSTART trial in uh, Japan. They've randomized almost 73,000 women in their 40s to either mammograms alone or mammograms plus ultrasound. They're finding more cancers in the women having ultrasound and the cancers they're finding are more frequently low stage. Most importantly, they have reduced the interval rate of cancers by half with only a slightly higher recall rate. This chart shows you the yield of mammograms, ultrasounds, MRIs in various combinations in women at greater than 20% lifetime risk. The highest is with MRI and mammography. And what this chart shows you is that if you're gonna do MRI, there's absolutely no need to do ultrasound also. So to summarize, breast ultrasound is widely available and relatively inexpensive. It requires no intravenous injection, doesn't use ionizing radiation, and it uses minimal pr uh, pressure compared to a mammogram. So it's not uncomfortable. For all these reasons, it has great acceptance by patients. And even though MRI is more sensitive, recall that in two unrelated studies, 40% of women declined MRI even when it was free. Now, as a bonus, when we do ultrasound and we see an abnormality, it's easy to use the ultrasound to guide the needle biopsy. And it meets the two important criteria I told you about. It finds mostly small invasive cancers, no negative, and it reduces the interval cancer rate. But what most women in New Brunswick and elsewhere in Canada with dense breasts 
are not having ultrasound. Their cancers are often found when they find a lump. Sometimes it's by doing a breast self-exam, but often they find it unexpectedly. And the task force says women shouldn't do breast exams. But for women with dense breasts who can't have supplemental screening ultrasound, doing breast self-exam can be the difference between being diagnosed at stage one or later. Ideally, all women should do breast self-exam because the majority of women in Canada who will get breast cancer are only having mammograms every two years. Even for women whose cancers will be visible on a mammogram, why let it grow for two years till your next mammogram when you might be able to find it on breast self-exam when it's smaller? You shouldn't obsess about it, but, but pay a little more attention to your breasts. Now, there are loads of demonstrations on how to do breast self-examination on YouTube, but I've listed this one and you'll get it when you uh, get the lecture later. Um, this is an excellent one by Dr. Liz O'Reardon. She's a breast cancer surgeon in the UK who's had breast cancer herself. So please check it out. It's only three minutes long. Another test showing good success in dense breasts is molecular breast imaging. Um, I, I know it's not available anywhere in Canada, but I'm just telling you about it in case you hear about it. It's a nuclear medicine test that requires intravenous injection of radioactivity, uh, but it takes 40 minutes to perform. Another test that's getting lots of attention is called contrast enhanced mammography. It uses mammography equipment and requires an intravenous injection, but instead of gadolinium that we use in MRIs, it's the same contrast that we use for CT scans. So we don't have to worry about gadolinium deposition. And what's really exciting is that it has a similar cancer detection rate to MRI. Now it's not yet in wide use, but I'm hearing that lots of departments across Canada are starting to purchase the necessary equipment. And it's also a reasonable alternative for MRI to women who would otherwise qualify for MRI but can't get it or can't tolerate it. And it's much faster uh, than the molecular breast imaging. Once the IV is started and the contrast is injected, it takes about seven minutes to take all the pictures. Now there are a couple of blood tests available, sometimes called liquid biopsies. One is from a company based in Calgary and it's currently available in an increasing number of cities. It's private pay even though they haven't even finished doing the testing and it costs about $500. Spoiler alert, it's not ready for prime time in my opinion. They presented their preliminary data on only 1,100 patients and they say that it's 92% sensitive in women under age 50 with few false positives, but it's only 79% sensitive overall, meaning that there are lots of false negatives. But stay tuned, this, uh, this could be a game changer. So to summarize, Experts in breast cancer screening differ from the Canadian Task Force on every one of their recommendations. Optimal screening means annual mammograms for all average US women starting at age 40. Women who are higher than average risk may need to start younger. Women should ideally continue as long as they're in good health with a life expectancy of around 10 years. All women should be told their breast density and women with dense breasts should have supplemental screening, usually with ultrasound or MRI or contrast mammography if it's available. Women who've had breast cancer should all have annual mammograms, starting at whatever age they're diagnosed. If they were diagnosed younger than age 50 or have dense breasts, they should also have MRI, and if MRI is not available, they should have ultrasound. So in addition to the good work New Brunswick is already doing, they could improve by allowing self-referral annually, starting at age 40, offering supplemental screening, to all women in category C and D, allowing women in good health to continue to self-refer past age 74. They should begin risk assessment for younger women between the ages of 25 and 30, and they should implement culturally relevant awareness campaigns for minority women. As an individual, what can you do? Prioritize your health, find out your breast density. Let us know, and when I say us, I mean let, let Dense Breast Canada know. If you have opportunities for I or my colleagues to speak to women's groups or your elected representatives, educate your friends, family, your coworkers, share this webinar with them. Learn more, including how to speak to your doctor about screening on mybreastscreening.ca. They even have scripts that help you advocate for yourself. And if you've had cancer, please consider your sharing your story on densebreastcanada.ca. You can make a difference by advocating. Write to your MP or your MLA. Dense Breast Canada has briefing notes you can share with them. Write to your 
health minister, Dorothy Shepard, to push for optimal screening and surveillance, help create partnerships with other women's health groups to bolster advocacy, and use the template letter on Dense Breast Canada website to write to your provincial government. Thank you so much for your attention and I'm looking forward to your questions. Hello everyone. Um, we do have some time for some questions at this point. Uh, I'm just looking at the chat room at the moment and maybe we'll start off with uh, what I see in the chat and then we can go from there. Um, so question Paula has asked and I think you kind of answered it, but I'll uh, pose it again. Uh, so as a provider and a person diagnosed with breast cancer with dense breasts, where do we go to advocate for earlier breast screening and additional screenings for women with dense breasts? Well, first of all, as I've to told you, you don't know if you have dense breasts until you have that first mammogram. So the key is to try to work on getting mammography starting at age 40. And the way to do that is to write letters um, to the um, health minister, uh, anybody you know in parliament uh, in, your, in your province. Um, it wouldn't hurt to write the federal representatives as well because a lot of these problems originate with that task force, which is federally funded. We have to fix the task force. And um, then once you know you have dense breasts, it's the same thing. First of all, a woman in her 40s, even if your screening program doesn't start till 50, a woman in her 40s who gets a requisition from her doctor mm -hmm. can have a diagnostic mammogram instead of a screening mammogram. And they're, they're, they're equivalent to start out with. So get that requisition. And if your doctor says no, be prepared because some of the, you know, you got to feel sorry for family doctors. They're supposed to know everything about everything. And a lot, you know, they don't have time to go into the kind, they don't even know the stuff I just taught you. So uh, they tend to trust the task force. The minister of the federal minister of health and, and PHAC, the um, uh, Public Health Agency of Canada, describes that task force as being an expert panel. So GPs trust them. They don't know that they're not expert. And so if you go on mybreastscreening.ca, they have scripts like, Here's what you can say to your family doctor to advocate for yourself. You go in with the script, maybe beg your doctor to watch this webinar. And if you can get that requisition for the diagnostic mammogram, that's the first step because then you find out if you have dense breasts and then you got to start advocating for screening ultrasound. If you get your family doctor once they're on side to write a requisition for screening ultrasound, then you can have a, hopefully you'll find a clinic in New Brunswick that's willing to do it. I'm told that, for example, in Nova Scotia, even if a woman has a requisition for, for screening ultrasound, nobody will do it. Thanks, Paula, that's great. Um, I saw somebody with their hand up, Joan. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, so I guess ethically I have a question and a, a concern as well. So we in New Brunswick have the ability to, you know, let, inform our patients if they do have a C or D uh, rating for dense breasts, but where do we go from there? I mean, it's, it's, I mean, we got the guidelines last summer, but we know they're at increased risk for breast cancer. So I guess, I don't know. I mean, can I can I justify it as a provider by saying there's a positive family history and here's the reasons why I feel they need to have additional testing or do you get what I'm where I'm going with this? Yes, yes. So let me just say that at the very least you could encourage them to do breast self exam because if you can't have supplemental screening and you're more likely to turn up with an interval cancer, let's find that interval cancer as small as possible. I mean, interval cancers in general have a worse prognosis and they're larger and so on. But if you find an interval cancer that's small, let's say she's lucky enough to have a small superficial cancer that she's gonna pick up on a breast self exam, that still beats waiting for it to become larger. Um, the um, the advocate, advocating for your patient, first of all, you said she's got a family history. Don't wait, you know, don't wait for the family history because as I told you, 
40% of those cancers we're finding with supplemental ultrasound in our practice are in women with no family history and don't only recommend it for category D because 60% of the cancers we're finding are in category C. So, so number one, number one, excuse me, encourage her to do breast self exam, uh, write the requisition and just say, you know, high risk of breast cancer, high risk of inter interval cancer. And hopefully as more and more people advocate, th these things are gonna change. Now, one of my pet peeves is that you gotta know that the only way things have changed to this point is by ordinary women, lay women advocating. And mm. it, always, it always troubles me that the women doing the advocating are the women who've already had cancer. And they've had cancer diagnosed late because of the guidelines. And I say to Jenny, who's the uh, founder and executive uh, director of Dense Breast Canada, why aren't more women who haven't had cancer yet advocating? Why is it only the patients who've had cancer? And her answer is, well, they're in denial. They, they don't realize it's going to happen to them. So, um, sorry, just turning off my phone. That's the landline. <laughs> I can't turn it off. Um, so. So you've got to mobilize and, and get your friends to write letters. Um, there, there are those templates. You don't have to invent the letter yourself. Go on mybreastscreening.ca and Dense Breast Canada. You'll find that template letter and you've got to get more women involved. Here's something interesting. Well, you see, you're all, New Brunswick is already telling women that they're dense. So you don't have to overcome that, that we had to overcome in BC. But now, you know, you've got to... You've got to encourage those women with dense breasts to start writing advocacy letters to their political representative. I'll tell you, one of the ways that things changed in British Columbia is Jenny's co-founder, Michelle Di Tommaso, was giving out forms in grocery lineups to women, saying, here's the form, ask for your breast density, send it in. And the screening program was so overwhelmed with women sending in their forms, they said, Oh, this is too much trouble to answer one moment at a time. We're going to talk, tell all women their density. So that kind of grassroots advocacy, from my experience, is the only way change is going to happen. Uh, so, Paula, we're about two minutes after three, so we need to think of wrapping up. Um, I do have one more um, question in the chat room, if you want to address that, and then we'll uh, wrap up for the session. Um, the question is, uh, we use the IBIS tool to calculate lifetime risk for breast cancer. If the risk is considered high, but that specific woman doesn't have dense breasts, and in brackets, for example, 30% risk with breast density type A or B, would you still recommend annual breast R M MRI? That's a really good question, and the answer is yes. So lifetime density is one of the risk factors that contribute to lifetime risk, but everything else, family history, uh, genetic testing, there are going to be new tests uh, very soon called uh, SNPs, which are, uh, that, that they can get from doing a buccal smear. So the, the science is changing so fast. But yes, women who are at high risk with or without breast density. And let me just... Um, embellish what you said at the beginning, Kim. If people have questions that we didn't have time to answer them, please put them in the chat. Kim will send them to me and I will answer them for you in the next few days. I don't want anybody's question to go unanswered. Well, thank you so much, Paula, for such an informative and thought-provoking uh, presentation to really help us start to look a little differently about uh, breast screening in this province. And hopefully it's the beginning of a discussion that will be ongoing um, over the weeks, months, um, and preferably not years down the road, but um, certainly get the conversation going. Um, I think you may have your slide deck still up. If you can stop sharing, that would be great. Um, it, it says it's not sharing. Okay. Uh, so then I'm gonna share my site. If we can get it to share here, just this. And so you should be seeing this slide here. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so I'm going to hand it over to Claire to uh, 
wrap up for the session today. Um, it's been an honor to be able to facilitate the session on behalf of Horizon uh, Health Network here in New Brunswick. And as you can tell, there were other partners with this session today as well in terms of the, the logos that are on the slide. So Claire. Thank you very much, Kim. And uh, it is, it's been, it's been just wonderful, this uh, sharing of, uh, well, information but it's more than information it's reality and reality that needs to be followed up on and uh, as a collective uh, group now uh, we have as an organization ourselves the new brunswick breast and women's cancer partnership we have had a meeting with the uh, minister of health or uh, her honor dorothy shepherd and uh, and she was invited to this session as well, but she did uh, write back and uh, indicated that she had other commitments and was well. Uh, uh, it, she felt it was unfortunate that there, there was this uh, conflict in time, but that is the situation. So we will share the recording uh, with her and as well ask uh, for other meetings with her. And uh, merci, uh, Dr. Gordon. Ça a été uh, très révélateur de votre présentation, les données puis les faits. Et uh, évidemment, oui, on va poursuivre uh, en, comme collectivité, comme groupe, pour arriver à obtenir uh, les uh, ben, les ajustements uh, d'après les données. Uh, qui sont uh, qui sont disponibles et qui qui uh, invite uh, à des uh, changements des changements qui vont vouloir uh, changer uh, prescrire des des changements de direction puis également naturellement ben, des directions qui sont modifiées par rapport au uh, au, au, au dépistage uh, uh, au screening uh, du uh, cancer du sein uh, y compris avec uh, des seins denses et, et le reste. Donc, il y en a beaucoup de nous autres uh, probablement uh, présents après-midi qui participent dans cette, uh, dans ce webinar qui, sait, uh, qui savent déjà de quoi il s'agit parce qu'on a passé par là. Mais il y en a d'autres non et de là, uh, we need a collective uh, movement and to get this uh, going. Now, Dr. Um, Gordon indicated that she might be back and uh, it uh, was registered. <laughs> and uh, we're hoping to, to be able to benefit from all this knowledge, all this experience, but it's as well, all this caring around making quality of life, making uh, cancer, uh, uh, well, detection and cancer control possible and a reality for New Brunswickers. Again, encore une fois, un gros merci. We will look at the comments, we will look at the at the questions and make sure that they are uh, they are reported. And thank you very much, Kim, for for this wonderful collaboration with you. It's been a while, but it's been a pleasure. Et uh, merci, uh, merci à toutes les, les, les participants et participantes. Et euh, ce n'est qu'un qu au revoir et à, et un, à bientôt. Donc, euh, merci et bonne fin euh, de semaine. Have a nice weekend, everyone. Enjoy and uh, we'll, see, we'll see each other soon. Thank you.